Hello and welcome to Lesson 7.2, Nuclear Reactions. We are starting with our data booklet reference page with an equation that you've seen before. So this is what we looked at in section 7.1, Einstein's famous energy matter equivalence formula. E is equal to mc squared. You're going to notice something different with this one, and that is that there is a delta symbol or the triangle symbol in front of both the E and the M, indicating that there is some change in energy and change in mass. So we'll get back to this later on in the video. All right, with nuclear reactions, there's two main types. Either two light things can come together and make something more massive, or you have one single massive thing splitting into lighter constituent parts. Now, in addition to having two types of nuclear processes, some are artificial and some are natural. For example, a radioactive decay. When you have a radioactive isotope that is unstable, it will naturally decay or split into two or more constituent pieces. Now, the first artificial or the first induced nuclear reaction was accomplished by Australian physicist Ernest Rutherford. I'm sure you heard of his name in grade nine science when you learned how to draw Bohr-Rutherford diagrams. So he was the same guy who bombarded atoms with alpha particles and discovered the nuclear structure of the atom. That is that the protons and the neutrons are inside the nucleus and that the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. Now, using alpha particles, and let's just remind ourselves what an alpha particle is, an alpha particle is a helium-4 nucleus. That is, there are two protons and two neutrons. Since the neutrons contribute no charge, the charge of the alpha particle is plus two. Okay? Plus two being in terms of the elementary charge, which you can find in your data booklet on the list of table of constants. Now, from his experience with these alpha emitters, Rutherford thought that alpha particles might just be energetic enough to breach the nuclear boundary. And sure enough, he was right. He was able to breach the nuclear boundary and create the first artificial or induced transmutation. So this is the nuclear reaction that he did. Starting off with nitrogen and bombarding it with an alpha particle, he was able to create oxygen with the leftover proton. So here's the uh, reaction equation. You've got the reactants on the left side of the arrow and the products on the right side. Now the proton on its own, that's really just the nucleus of a hydrogen atom because it's missing the electron. Since this was the first example of artificial or induced transmutation, well, you might know that by another name, alchemy. Now, this was not the only type of induced artificial transmutation that has occurred. More recently, another successful transmutation that probably will pique your interest a bit more is the following. Taking mercury and bombarding it with a proton resulted in the production of gold and an alpha particle. So gold was artificially created. It was possible to somehow merge pro, uh, proton with mercury in order to create gold with the byproduct of the alpha particle. Now, before you start thinking that you can create bootleg gold in your basement, you have to realize that the amount of energy that went into creating this gold what far outweighed any possible benefit that you could get from the gold atom extracted. In fact, producing this gold through this reaction involves very expensive, very large particle accelerators. So not something that you're going to be doing in your basement anytime soon. Here is an example of a nuclear reaction equation. Polonium-214 becoming lead-210 plus the helium-4 nucleus, the alpha particle. Let's remind ourselves of the structure of how this looks. So if you have your element name in the top left, we have the number of nucleons. Remember, a nucleon is a particle in the nucleus, hence the same prefix in the name. So that would be either protons and, or neutrons. And in this case, A represents the total number of protons and neutrons. Protons is represented with capital Z on the bottom left, and neutrons is represented with capital N on the bottom right. Although from we, what we saw in 7.1, we don't usually write the number for Z and N. Definitely not N, but sometimes Z. Now, there are two conservation laws we can use in order to help us complete these types of reaction equations. The first is the conservation of nucleons, and that tells us that the top number in each side of this equation has to balance. So the 214 on the left side of the arrow has to balance the 210 plus 4 on the right, which it does. Since 
If you are changing from one form to another, if you're either undergoing beta minus decay or beta positive decay, either a proton is becoming a neutron and some other, um, some other pieces, or a neutron is becoming a proton plus some other pieces. So regardless, you're exchanging one nucleon for the other. So the total number of nucleons has to stay the same. The second is the conservation of charge. Okay, so charge here is coming from the proton. So if we have 84 protons for polonium, 82 protons for lead, well, we have two protons in the helium-4 nucleus, so we have 84 on each side. All right, let's try this example. Carbon-14 undergoes beta decay to become nitrogen-14. Construct and balance the nuclear equation. All right, so let's start with what we know. We know we're starting off with carbon-14, and this is decaying into nitrogen-14. Okay, well, what else is there? Well, we know there's going to be some kind of byproduct. And in order to get more information here, there is some information missing from this problem. And in this particular case, it does require us to have knowledge of the periodic table. Now, knowing what number carbon is, well, we can figure out the top number using conservation of nucleon number. Uh, but for the next step, we're going to have to know the atomic number of carbon. So at least for this part, the conservation of nucleon number, we can see 14 nucleons for carbon. There are still 14 nucleons for nitrogen. And so whatever this E is going to be, whether it's a positron or an electron, I know I've put the number zero in the top left. And that should make sense because an electron is not a nucleon. It's not a proton nor an, a neutron. So it cannot fit into that criteria. Now, from the periodic table, we would find that carbon has atomic number six and nitrogen has atomic number seven. So we can stick those numbers in as well. Now, on the left, we have six positive charges. On the right, we have seven. And so in order to balance the equation, the charge on the bottom left of the E has to be minus one. Well, what would that then represent? That has to represent an electron. Okay, so because you have an electron given off, that means you have beta minus decay. And in addition to that, that means there is one more particle missing from the right side. When you have beta minus decay, you also release an antineutrino. So we stick that in as well. Now, there are a lot of different symbols for the various particles. So in the past, so let me just go to my page here and show you. In section 7.1, we represented the electron <clears throat> like this. So this was section 7.1, and this was the electron. Now we are more properly representing the electron like this. So E, 0, 1. Okay, so overall, this is how you are representing uh, the value. So you have some kind of symbol. You have the mass number on the top left, or the number of nucleons. You have the charge on the bottom left, and of course, well, the symbol right here. Okay, so this would be the correct symbol for electron. Let's just stick that minus sign in there. Okay, so I'll show you the correct symbols for the other quantities as well. So for a proton, okay, so it has the letter lowercase p. That is one nucleon, so we put number one up here. And it, by definition, it has one proton, so we stick a one there as well. All right, now what about a neutron? Well, neutron, as you might guess, is represented with the letter lowercase n. Because a neutron is also an example of a nucleon, we stick a 1 in the top left, but it has no protons, right? By definition, it's a neutron, so we stick a 0 there. All right, an electron we saw, it's E0 minus 1. Now, what about a photon? Well, remember, the photons that are given off with the gamma radiation are in the wavelength of, like I said, gamma radiation. So we use the Greek symbol gamma, and at least this is how we represented it in section 7.1. Now, if you want to be really specific with the numbers, and you might see it in either one of these methods, you would put the numbers on the left side as well. So the photon, it doesn't have any nucleons, so we put a zero here, and it has no protons, so we put a zero here. So these two symbols mean the same thing. Um, alpha particle. Okay, alpha particle is a helium-4 nucleus. That means four nucleons, two of which are protons. Now we can represent it like this, or we can represent it like this, a 4-2 with an alpha. 
these two things mean the same. Uh, what about a neutrino? So a neutrino, so far we've represented with the Greek symbol mu. Okay, this is another version of the mu. Okay, so we can represent it like this or with the numbers as well. So this has no nucleons and no protons. And finally, the last piece to complete the puzzle would be the anti-neutrino. And so we represent that with mu, with a bar symbol on top, or we put the mu, the bar on top, with the two zeros on the left. So just make sure you have that somewhere in your notes because it is important. All right, let's go back to the slides. All right. Uh, in a laboratory, when aluminum nuclei are bombarded with alpha particles, the following reaction may take place. Now it says may because, well, first of all, it's in a laboratory, so the induced transmutation may or may not happen. But at the same time, sometimes different products are created. It's not always the same products, whether it's artificial or whether it's a natural decay or a natural fission process. All right, so what is this an example of? Well, let's just check something first. Notice that conservation of number of nucleons is occurring. We have 427, which makes 31 on the left, 30 and 1, which makes 31 on the right. This is also satisfying conservation of charge, as we have 13 plus 2 on the left and 15 plus 0 on the right. Always good to do a quick check. So we've got a helium-4 nucleus bombarding the aluminum-27. This is becoming phosphorus-30 plus a neutron. All right. So is an example of nuclear fission? Well, if it was fission, you would have a single reactant that is splitting into two or more uh, products or constituent pieces. Nuclear fusion? Well, it might be nuclear fusion because you are merging two things together. If fission means that one piece is splitting into two or more pieces, then fusion would be two or more pieces merging into a single piece. All right, so this might be it. So we'll just put a we'll just put a tack on this right now. C, natural radioactive decay. Well, it's not natural radioactive decay because you are bombarding it with an alpha particle. You don't have one entity on the left side. So A and C are not correct. D, artificial transmutation. Well, artificial transmutation does involve the bombardment of an alpha particle, but how do we differentiate between nuclear fusion and artificial transmutation? Well, the key lies in the question. In the first line, we're told in a laboratory. So because it's being done in a laboratory, this is being done artificially, and therefore the answer is D. All right, next. When a high energy alpha particle collides with an aluminum 27 nucleus, a nucleus of phosphorus may be produced. Which of the following equations correctly shows this transmutation? All right, so first things first, what's an alpha particle? You have to know this. An alpha particle is a helium-4 nucleus. So like I sh uh, just showed you on the paper, that means we have a mass number of four, a charge of two, and so the number on the top left must be four, and the bottom number on the bottom left must be two, as you have in example A. C, you have a two and a one, that is incorrect. So C cannot be correct. D cannot be correct for the same reason. You've got helium with a two and a one. So, so far our answer is either going to be A or B as B also has the correct symbol for the alpha particle. Now, we can also check for conservation laws. So conservation of nucleons. For A, we have 27 plus four is 31 on the left. 30 plus one is 31 on the right. 13 plus two is 15 on the left. 15 and 0 is 15 on the right. Okay, so far that checks out. For B, 24 and 7 makes 31, 30 and 1 makes 31. 13 and 2 makes 15, 15 and 0 makes 15. So both of them actually satisfy the conservation law. So that means there is something else, something which you may have noticed already. If you pay close attention to the equation, everything looks okay except the last piece in one of these. Okay, so remember, the top left number means number of nucleons. Now, while both the proton and the neutron should have a 1 in the top left, the proton should have a 1 in the bottom left as well, because by definition, it's a proton. It has 1 of itself, and the neutron has 0 of itself, which means the symbol for proton is incorrect in, in part B, and the symbol for neutron is correct in part A, which means A is correct. And so, of course, there's another explanation here on the slides, which I'll just leave up for a second.
Okay. When the isotope aluminum-27 is bombarded with alpha particles, the following nuclear reaction can take place. So the helium-4 plus aluminum-27 becomes some, some component X plus a neutron. Which one of the following correctly gives the atomic or proton number and mass nucleon number of the nucleus X? And so in order to answer this, we are going to just straight up use conservation laws. So conservation of nucleons first, we have 27 and 4 on the left, that's 31. Now for a neutron, so actually let me just do this on the piece of paper so it will be easier to see. Let me write down this equation. So we have a helium plus aluminum becoming X plus a neutron. So the first thing I would do is replace neutron with its symbol. Okay, so I already showed you what the symbol was. It's right here, 10n. So we have 42he plus 2713al becoming x plus 10n. So using our conservation laws, I can see that I have 31 nucleons on the left. That means I need 31 nucleons on the right. So the only number that can be up here is 30. Right, in order so 30 and 1 makes 31. Now I have conservation of charge, 13 and two makes 15. I have zero charge coming from the neutron, so therefore this must be 15. All right, so going back to our possibilities, that means the nucleon number is 30, and there's only one match for that, and we just make sure that the proton number is 15 to ensure that we did our work correctly. And so the answer is A. Okay. Next, the isotope sodium-24 undergoes radioactive decay to the stable isotope magnesium-24. Complete the nuclear reaction equation for this decay. All right, so going back to the paper. So let's do this problem now. All right, so we have sodium-2411 becoming magnesium 24, 12. Okay, so we see that there is conservation of nucleons so far. We've got 24 on the left, 24 on the right, and I can see here that I start with 11 protons, and I end up with 12 protons, so I'm up one spot on the periodic table. In order to have gained a proton, well, something must have changed into a proton for it to be added, and so that means a neutron A neutron must have decayed and became a proton, right? So this way, the nucleon number would stay the same because you would lose one here and gain one here. So that number would stay the same, but you would gain a proton, which is represented in this diagram. Now, how do you lose a neutron and gain a proton? Well, that's called beta minus decay. And we saw this in section 7.1. Now, beta minus decay is not just a neutron becoming a proton. There's other byproducts as well. An electron is shot out of the nucleus, and we also release an antineutrino. Okay, so the question asks us to complete the nuclear reaction equation for this decay. And so I know that there's going to be an electron, and now I know the proper symbol for electron. It looks like this, E0 minus 1. plus antineutrino. And if you want to get really precise, you can stick the zeros in there as well. So just to be sure, we've got 24, 24, 0, 0. Okay, so every, that matches. We've got 11, and on this side we have 12 minus 1, which is 11. So everything looks good. Okay, next. K capture is a process that occurs when a nucleus captures an electron from the innermost shell of electrons surrounding the nucleus. All right, so let me just show you something really quickly because you've probably never heard of K-capture. You may study this in chemistry, but just in case, let me show you what that means. So if you have the nucleus of the atom, based on an elementary view of the orbits in an atom, we could say that, <clears throat> excuse me, we can say that there's one orbit here, and then we have the second orbit right above it. 
And we have the third orbit above that, and the fourth, and etc. Okay, the first orbit goes by the letter K, the second orbit by the letter L, the third by the letter M, and then N. Okay, so but we don't really need to worry about anything past K. But the idea is, in this problem, we're calling it K capture. And it says it's a process that occurs when the nucleus, so there's the nucleus, captures an electron from the innermost shell. And the innermost shell is known as the K shell. Right, so now you know what that means. All right, so it captures it from the innermost shell of electrons surrounding the nucleus. When K capture occurs in iron 55, so there we have the atomic number as well, which is 26, the nucleus is changed into a manganese nucleus. Which equation represents this change? Well, first thing, this one is actually not as complicated as you might think. If you are capturing an electron, well, that means electron has to be on the left side of the equation, so on the left side of the arrow. And at this point, you just have to understand which one of these is the correct symbol. Remember that an electron is not a nucleon. So on the top left, the number should be zero, not one as it is in B and D. So that both of these are incorrect. Now comparing A and C, we remind ourselves that the charge is minus one, not positive one like in A. And so that means A is also incorrect. The only possible answer here would be C. And you can verify that by simply looking at conservation of charge. 26 minus 1 is 25. Conservation of nucleons also satisfied. 55 plus 0 is 55. So the correct answer is C. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next thing we're going to be looking at is a new type of unit to express the mass of atoms. In section 7.1, we saw that in order to express the energy that certain atoms or charges have, it is sometimes more convenient to express that energy in a unit called electron volts or EV instead of joules because the value in joules would just be so, so, so small and it just would have a more manageable number to work with electron volts. Now, when we work with nuclear reactions, masses also get very, very small. So for instance, let me ask you to take out your data booklet and I will direct your attention to something. In your data booklet, if you look past the halfway point, there is electron mass, proton mass, and neutron mass. We will be using those quite a bit in this video, although you will be using it again in grade 12 a lot. So, what I want you to notice is that the first value for each of those entries is in kilograms. And just take a look at those numbers. For example, for the neutron, you have 1.675 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That's 0 0.0000, 27 zeros with the one, or sorry, 26 zeros actually after the decimal, and then a 1675. That is an extremely small number. So <clears throat> while scientific notation is at least expressing the number better than writing all those zeros with the decimal, it's still not that convenient because it's a very tiny number and difficult to relate to. So instead of, um, instead of expressing it in kilograms, we express it in terms of another unit. If you look to the right of it, there's another number there, 1.008665U. That U stands for atomic mass unit. And if you look on the table, that's the next item down the unified atomic mass unit. This is simply based on a definition that physicists came up with. So the symbol U, so this is instead of kilograms, one atomic mass unit is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And so you can see then for the neutron, we saw the mass is just over one U. The proton's mass is just over one U, but different than that of the neutron, a little bit lower. And for the electron, well, it's quite a bit smaller than U, but still a number more manageable than that in kilograms. So we're going to be using the atomic mass unit quite a bit. So let's go back to the slides. All right. Now, by definition, this unified atomic mass unit, which we symbolize with the letter U, sometimes in chemistry, it's actually symbolized with the, with the letters AMU. So you might see it as AMU or just U. Now, it's defined as using a neutral carbon-12 atom as the standard. So, 
one atomic mass unit is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. We say that one atom of carbon 12 has a mass of 12.000000 atomic mass units. And whatever its mass is in kilograms, we take that, divide by 12, and arrive at this number. Now there's another piece to this on the right side here, 931.5 mega electron volts C to the minus two. I wanna just explore that unit with you for a moment. We're not gonna be using that number at the beginning of this video, but we will towards the end. So if one U is equal to 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, and that is also equal to 931.5, mega electron volts c to the minus two well remember mega electron volts at the end of the day that's a unit for energy right so if you take energy and c to the minus two is just one over c squared so really the units you have here are e over c squared right these are the units well e divided by c squared is equal to m right because e is equal to mc squared and so this unit, MEV, C to the minus 2, that is a unit which also communicates mass to us. It just looks a little bit different. It's mega electron volt C to the minus 2, but it's still mass. So this is a unit of mass, this is a unit of mass, and this is a unit of mass. We've got three different ways of showing it. Okay, let's try this example. How many AMU, so there it is, atomic mass units, is 25.32 grams of anything. So let's do that. So we have 25.32 grams, and we want to know how many atomic mass units there are. So I'm going to use something called the need to know method. And for those of you that check your homework and go through my solutions, you would have seen this before. The need to know method. This is actually what my high school chemistry teacher used to call it, and this is how I've remembered it ever since. Although some people also like to call this the ratio method. You put the known ratio on the right, and you put your unknown ratio on the left. Usually your unknown is best placed in the top left of the left side. All right, so we are looking for the amount of atomic mass units, so we'll call that X, for 25.32 grams. And the known ratio that we have is that one atomic mass unit, or one U, is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Now we have to make sure that these units match up. So whatever units you have on the left, so AMU, AMU, in the numerator they match, in the denominator they have to match too. So if I have kilograms on the right, I need kilograms on the left. So that means that X AMU divided by 0 0.02532 kilograms, right? So if I multiply that by 1,000, 1, 2, 3, I get exactly what I started with, is equal to 1 AMU divided by 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So then rearranging that for X, okay, so I'm going to get 0 0.02532 kilograms. Now you're going to see why the units are important times 1 AMU divided by 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Because this is a ratio method, it's not a formula from your data booklet, it doesn't really matter what units you plug in here as long as they're consistent. Like I said, the numerator units have to match and the denominator units have to match. Because once you rearrange this, keeping your unknown in the top left, when you rearrange this, notice I have kilograms on top, kilograms on the bottom. If those units are the same, then I can cancel it out like this. And the units I'm left with are AMU, which is exactly what I want. So I'm going to grab my calculator, and I'm going to do 0 0.02532 divided by 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27. And I get... I got a big number, 1.52 times 10 to the 25 atomic mass units. So something like this, you see this number right here is probably better expressed in, expressed in grams. So not everything is best expressed on atomic mass units, right? But why was this not well expressed in atomic mass units? Because it's not referencing an atomic mass. 
25.32 grams, I mean, that's just over a tablespoon, right? So a tablespoon is about 15 mils. So if we're considering water, that might be between one and two tablespoons. So that's definitely not an atomic scale, which is why you're getting such a huge number here. Overall, there are appropriate units for appropriate situations. All right, let's try this. The unified mass unit is defined as now this one, you just have to know. So I would say pause the video now and look over the answers. Hopefully you had a chance to pause the video. If not, do it right now, please, and try to figure out what the answer is. This, you simply have to know. We just talked about the definition on an earlier slide. You have to realize that the answer is B. By definition, the unified mass unit is 1 12th the mass of one neutral atom of carbon 12. Okay, so that was based on our definition from earlier. So the answer is B. Okay, mass defect and nuclear binding energy. We introduced the idea of mass defect in 7.1, but we're really going to get into it now in section 7.2. And we're gonna understand what the relationship is between this mass defect and nuclear binding energy. Now, before we get into that, we have to understand Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. So there's that equation that I said would pop up again, or delta E equals delta mc squared. Now, what this equation means, at the end of the day, it means that mass and energy are interchangeable. If you have a certain amount of mass, that can be converted into an equivalent amount of energy. Now, you got to remember that not all processes are efficient, especially for a process like this. And so, it's not as if you can take a cabbage, take its mass, and convert it all into energy. It doesn't work like that. But using this equation, we can figure out how much energy it would take to break apart an atom of a certain mass. Okay, let's just try this for fun, though. If one kilogram of anything is converted completely into energy, how much energy would be released? So let's calculate that. Now keep in mind, theoretically, that wouldn't actually happen. You can't just... Like I said, take a cabbage or a bowling ball and just convert it all to energy. There's a lot of efficiencies that will be lost in that kind of a process. Okay, so we have a mass of one kilogram and we want to convert it fully into energy. And so I know that E is equal to mc squared. So the mass is already in SI units. My value of C, now if you forgot what it is, I mean it's 300 million meters per second, but you can always look it up on your data booklet. So if you go exactly, well actually just past the halfway point, we have speed of light in vacuum. There's lowercase c, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So if you ever forget, it's there. But there is one value actually that is not in your table of constants, an important value, and that is the speed of sound at room temperature at 20 degrees Celsius. And the reason that's not there is because, as I just said in my statement, that's the speed of sound at room temperature, 343 meters per second. So if the temperature changes or the medium changes, then that number is no longer relevant, So which is why it's not included in the data booklet. All right, so we need to square that. Um, Right, okay, so three times 10 to the eighth squared. So let's just do this quickly. Nine times 10 to the 16. And that's gonna be joules. That's a lot of energy. But like I said, this is not such an efficient process that the entire one kilogram vegetable or fruit gets converted into energy purely. Although if it could happen, that would be amazing. So just to give you some reference point here, one megaton of TNT would release actually less energy than one kilogram of, let's say, a cabbage, right? So this is why the energy transference is not very efficient. Okay, let's see how we can find the mass defect. Well, the first step in order to find the mass defect of a reaction is find the mass of the reactants. The second step would be to find the mass of the products. And finally, you would take their difference. So you would subtract them. Now, it doesn't matter which order you subtract it. You just take the absolute value of that number. We just care about the positive value. All right, so let's give this a try. First things first, let's label the reactants and the products in the following nuclear reaction. So we have 
two hydrogens mixing with two neutrons and we get a helium-4 at the end of it all. So we have two things merging into one single product. So our reactants are on the left, our product is on the right. This would be an example of a fusion nuclear reaction because you have two or more reactants merging into a single product. All right, using the following table, find the mass defect in the following nuclear reaction. Okay, so you've got the table. Hopefully you've got the notes printed out in front of you as well. We're gonna go to our sheet of paper here and solve this. Okay, so let's just start on a new sheet here. All right, so first thing I wanna do is write down the nuclear reaction equation. So I've got two hydrogen and two neutrons, and this is turning into helium-4. Okay. Now, in the table, I'm given the masses of various particles, and I'm given the mass in atomic mass units. Now, on the left side, so let's say the mass of the reactant, so M sub R, I've got two H1 atoms. So 2 times 1.007825 U, this is directly from the table, plus 2 neutrons. So 1.008665 U. Okay, so let's see what that equals. 2 times 1.007825 plus... 2 times 1.008665. So we have 4.033. Oh, you know what? Let's actually write this exact. 4.03298U. That's better. Okay. Mass of the product. So we have a helium-4 particle or helium-4 atom. And we're just given the mass directly. 4.002603. U. Okay, so what do we notice right from the get-go? I noticed that the mass of the reactants is bigger than the mass of the products. So in order to find the mass defect, delta M, that's going to be mass of, now usually we do final minus initial, which is product minus reactant. But like I said, we just care about the absolute value. So in this kind of an equation where you have fusion, the mass of the reactants will be bigger. So if you want, you can do this. You can put absolute value symbols and do mass of the product minus mass of the reactants. Or you could just take mass of reactants minus mass of products. Okay, 4.03298U minus 4.002603U. Okay, so we already have that number in our calculator, minus 4.002603. So that's... 0.030377U. So that is, in fact, the mass defect, although this is the mass defect expressed in atomic mass units. So if you wanted to express the mass defect in kilograms, now you have to convert it. So remember my rule whenever you want to convert any kind of unit. So if I have 0.030377U, you always multiply by 1. Now, what you do is you replace that one with an empty fraction. Whatever unit you're trying to get rid of, you stick that in the denominator. Whatever unit you're trying to get out, you stick that in the numerator. Now you have to figure out what ratio of what to what is equal to one. Okay, so if you grab your formula sheet, you can see that one atomic mass unit is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So one of these is 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27, we'll just fit that in there, uh, kilograms. So this way the U's cancel, and I'm left with kilograms. So taking this number and multiplying by 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27. So we have 5.05 approximately. 5.05 times 10 to the minus 29 kilograms. So that's another way of expressing the mass defect. Okay. So 
So at the bottom of the slide, you're going to notice that node is there again. Notice that the reactant has less mass than its constituents. But throughout this entire course of physics, you've always been taught that there are well, two main truths that always hold true, conservation of energy and conservation of mass. Well, and now you would have also learned about conservation of charge, but more on that in grade 12 physics. Conservation of mass. So where did the missing mass go? Hey, and this is where Einstein's idea of the energy mass equivalence comes into play. The energy that is missing in the form of the product is in the form of something called binding energy, which we represent with a capital E and a subscript lowercase b. This is the amount of energy or work that you must put into that product until you can pull it apart into its constituent parts. So whatever mass was missing, if we convert that to an amount in energy using Einstein's E is equal to mc squared, that's how much energy we would need for, so for in this example, to take the helium-4 nucleus and separate it into individual, uh, a proton, proton, neutron, and neutron. So the four individual pieces. Okay, so let's actually do that. What is the binding energy in the helium-4 in this nuclear reaction? So let's find out. Now, like I said, in order to find binding energy, so this is a continuation of this problem, we need the formula E is equal to mc squared. Now, some of you would like to express it as delta E is equal to delta mc squared, so that's fine because in this case we're using delta m. So the binding energy would technically be delta E. Now, the m that you plug into this formula has to be in the SI units because this is a physics formula after all. So that's why if you didn't convert from atomic mass units to kilograms in the first part of the problem, that would be the first step in the next this part of the problem. So I would have to first convert delta m into kilograms. Now, since I've already done that, I can go ahead and plug it in right here. So the binding energy is equal to, so 5.05 times 10 to the negative 29 kilograms times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and that gets squared. So grab your calculator. 5.05 times 10 to the negative 29 times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So that's 4.545 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. All right, so if we were to supply this much energy to the helium-4 nucleus, we could break it up from what it is right now, which is just the two protons and two neutrons all merged together into two separate protons and two separate neutrons. That's what it means. I can break it apart. So that missing mass on the right side is in the form of energy that's binding the helium-4 nucleus together. And everything that we just talked about is on the slide. Okay. Here's a picture of the reaction, which might help. If you wish to disassemble helium-4 and into its constituent parts, parts, which were the two hydrogen nuclei, so the two protons and the two neutrons, you would have to add that energy, the 4.54 times 10 to the minus 12 joules. Now, the way we did it was the reverse process. We took those constituent parts, the two protons and the two neutrons, and we made the helium-4 plus that energy. So either the binding energy is on the right or it's on the left, but either way, it's always going to be with the helium nucleus. So what that means is when you merge these two together, so when you have nuclear fusion, like we saw in our example, you end up releasing energy as part of the, as part of the reaction. But if you're actually trying to fission this helium-4 nucleus, you have to put energy into it. So fission on top, fusion on the bottom. In some cases, fission is more preferable. In some cases, fusion is more preferable. And we'll come back to that idea towards the end of the video. All right, let's try this problem. Radium-226 undergoes natural radioactive decay to disintegrate spontaneously with the emission of an alpha particle to form radon. Calculate the energy in joules that is released. Okay, so... We're given all the information we need in the problem, so let's give this a try. 
Okay. So radium 226, and this is our example. So radium 226 undergoes natural radioactive decay and naturally disintegrates into radon and an alpha particle. Okay, so now the alpha particle I know is four and two. Now radon, based on how this looks, I can figure out what it's gonna look like. So I've got 226, I've got four, so this is gonna be 222. Okay, I don't necessarily have to write this equation, but you can because you have enough information to do so. All right, so calculate the energy in joules that is released. Energy is going to be released if we have some kind of uh, piece here to the equation, so plus energy. That means the mass of the products is going to be less than the mass of the reactants. Or in this case, reactant. Okay, so let's figure out what these masses are. So mass of the reactant, uh, we're told in the table it's 226.0254U. The mass of the product is going to be, so it's going to be that of radon plus the alpha particle, so that's 222.0176u plus 4.0026u. So 222.0176 plus 4.0026. So what do we get? 226.0202. All right. So let's find our mass defect. So that's going to be uh, the mass of the, I'll just do mass of reactants minus mass of products because that'll just return me a whole number right away. So 226.0254 minus answer. So 5.2 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's in atomic mass units, so keep your units straight, right? In order to find the energy, I have to convert this mass defect into kilograms. And so I'm going to take that number, so delta M, which is 5.2 times 10 to the minus 3U, and I'm going to multiply by, well, I know that 1U is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So my U's cancel. I guess I shouldn't have got rid of that off the calculator screen, but here we go. 5.2 times 10 to the negative 3 times 1.661 uh, times 10 to the negative 27. So in kilograms, that's 8.6372 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. Okay. So we've got our mass defect in the right units. To find the energy in joules, I use this equation. So delta E is equal to delta M times C squared. So 8.6372 times 10 to the negative 30 kilograms times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and that's getting squared. So that number times 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. So we get 7 point, now at this point, let's just round it because this is a lot of decimals. 7.8 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Now, the only reason we gave this answer in joules is because the question specifically asked us to do so. But looking at that number, you can see that that's probably not the best unit to express the answer in. Because we're dealing with such a small value times 10 to the minus 13, it would probably be better to express this answer in terms of the unit electron volts. Okay, so let's keep going. All right. Now, we introduce a new example, a new concept, rather, on this slide, and that is the binding energy per nucleon. So earlier, so not in the last example, but the previous one where we had uh, the binding energy of the helium-4 nucleus, we found that there was a certain amount of energy required to separate the helium-4 nucleus, the four uh, nucleons, the two protons, the two neutrons, into their individual constituent parts. Now, there were four nucleons in that atom. Now, if you wanted to find the binding energy per nucleon, all you would have to do is find the binding energy for the entire nucleus and divide it by the number of nucleons. So for this one, 
what is the binding energy per nucleon of the helium-4? Well, let's go back to our work here. Remember that the binding energy for the helium nucleus we just found earlier was 4.545 times 10 to the minus 12 joules, and that was for four nucleons. So therefore, the binding energy per nucleon, I take this number and I divide by four. So that's what I'm going to do here on this uh, next sheet of paper. I'm going to take 4.545 times 10 to the minus 12 joules, and I'm going to divide that by four. So this is going to be the binding energy per nucleon. So 4.545 times 10 to the minus 12 divided by 4. So we get 1.14 times 10 to the negative 12, and that's joules. So that is how much energy is needed per nucleon. Now, what's the point of finding this value per nucleon other than an exercise in doing so? Well, it's pretty important because by knowing the binding energy per nucleon of various atoms and nuclei, I can figure out what atoms are stable and what atoms are not stable. And so we're going to be looking at the binding energy per nucleon on a specific curve, on a graph. So if there's more binding energy per nucleon for a certain atom, that means in order to separate the pieces, I would have to put more energy in to take each individual piece away. In other words, they're already held together much better and the whole configuration is more stable as a result. And that's what we really care about, what's stable, things with higher binding energy. So let's look at that graph. Okay, so this is the binding energy curve. Now notice not all the elements are written on this one, but we've got hydrogen, helium, we've got oxygen, iron, uh, tin, and uranium. Now there's a couple important ones here, but let's, let's do some investigating here. So for example here, what is the most stable element? Well, we just talked about what makes an element stable. We said that it would have the highest binding energy per nucleon because that would make it really difficult to separate its constituent parts. So it's less likely to break down. On this graph, we have binding energy per nucleon in mega electron volts along the vertical axis and the number of nucleons or the mass number along the horizontal axis. And so that means the element that is most stable is gonna be that which has the highest binding energy, that which has the highest vertical value or dependent variable value. So that would be iron 56. <clears throat> Excuse me. What is the binding energy of uranium-238? Okay, well, uranium-238, initially it might be a little bit hard to see. Okay, so you would have to take a horizontal line across this graph and see where it intersects the vertical axis. Now, when you glance at it, it looks like it's about 7.5, 7.6. So if you pick either one of those, it's okay. But what you have to remember is that that is the binding energy per nucleon. So we have 7.6 mega electron volts. That is per nucleon. Now uranium-238, looking at this, I can clearly see that the 92 protons is just part of the 238 nucleons. There are 238 nucleons in total. So I would take this number, 7.6 mega electron volts, and multiply by 200 and 38, <clears throat> giving me overall 1800 mega electron volts, which then if I want, I can convert to joules or just standard electron volts. All right, next, what is the mass defect of uranium-238 if assembled from scratch? Okay, well, earlier we actually looked at this. What is a result of the mass defect? When we calculate delta M, we do so so that we figure out what the binding energy is. So binding energy and mass defect are really two sides of a mirror. They're really one and the same thing. And the connection here is, well, the speed of light squared. And so the fact that we already have the binding energy, which you just found in the previous part of the question, all you need to do is then convert that with the appropriate units. So we have 1800 mega electron volts. In order to convert that to a mass, well, using the physics data booklet, we have this conversion. 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, which is 931.5 mega electron volts per C squared. So you can use this. So you don't have to convert electron volts 
uh, to Jules, and then we'll go through this entire big process. All you have to use is this, this right piece right here. Remember that MEVC to the minus two, that's another unit that represents mass. And well, that's one of the first things I proved in this lesson. All right, so multiplying 1800 MEV by one, and our one is gonna be this expression right here. Okay, we're gonna end up with the correct mass value of 3.21 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. All right, let's take a look at this. Iron 54 has a mass of 53.9396U. A proton with an electron has a mass of 1.00782U and a neutron has a mass of 1.00866U. Part A, find the binding energy of iron 54 in mega electron volts per C squared. Now, while it's not specifically written in this question, we actually saw on the binding energy curve that iron has an atomic number of 26. So Z is equal to 26. We can see that A is equal to 54, and therefore the number of neutrons would be the difference between these two, 54 minus 26, which is 28. And so we know what the mass of iron is, but we're gonna to try to calculate this piece by piece as well. There's 26 protons, and because it's a neutral atom of iron, therefore it's gonna have 26 electrons as well. We're given the combined mass of protons with electrons, so we just have to account for that once. So 26 times this value right here. And we just determined that there are 28 neutrons, so plus 28 times the mass of a neutron, and we get this value right here, 54.4458U. So then the question becomes, well, why is this number different than this number? It, which one of these is really the mass of iron? Well, and the truth is that, well, one of them is the right mass, and the difference between the two is telling us where the missing mass is hidden in the form of binding energy. And so first thing we do is find what that mass defect is. So subtracting those two values, we get 0 0.5062 atomic mass units. Okay, so then to find the binding energy, multiplying that by 931.5 mega electron volts per C squared, I get 471.5 mega electron volts per C squared. Now, that is technically a unit of mass, but mass and energy, remember, they're equivalent. So then to convert that to an energy unit really is not that much of a, of a far stretch. Okay, find the binding energy per nucleon of iron 54. Well, we just found what it was. It was 471.5 mega electron volts C to the minus two. So how many nucleons does iron 54 have? Well, it has 54. You can see that right here in the slide. So if we take that number and we divide it by 54, we get 8.7 mega electron volts per nucleon. And well, this is consistent with the graph. Now, let's talk a little bit about the difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Fission is when you have a large nucleus that splits into two smaller nuclei. Now, the initial large nucleus that splits is called the parent atom and the two smaller nuclei that are formed are called the daughter nuclei. Here's an example of a fission reaction. You have uranium-235. Now, that is a very popular ingredient in most nuclear reactors because it undergoes nuclear fission naturally, and then when bombarded with a neutron, it actually undergoes a nice, beautiful chain reaction if controlled properly. So, uranium-235 is bombarded with a neutron. It temporarily becomes the high-energy uranium-236, which then spontaneously decays. It may actually spontaneously decay into these products. It may actually decay into other uh, pairs of products. So there's other combinations that can work here as well. Uh, one possible combination is xenon-140 and strontium-94 plus two more neutrons. Now the animation unfortunately doesn't work because uh, well, the computer is running a bit slow, but once you see the slides posted, please watch the animation. Essentially what happened, the animation just shows this. It shows initially an atom of uranium-235. So imagine these left and right piece smushed together originally. In comes a neutron. When the neutron hits the uranium-235 nucleus at just the right speed, it excites the uranium-235 nucleus. It becomes uranium-236. But at the same time, this excited uranium-236 is unstable. And then it spontaneously decays into these two counter pieces 
strontium and xenon, which now you see in the picture, and two neutrons, <clears throat> which move off with some kinetic energy. Now, what's interesting here is that it took one neutron to initiate the fission of a single uranium-235 atom. And the fission of that atom in that reaction resulted in the release of two more neutrons. So theoretically, if there were two more uranium-235 nuclei around, each one of those neutrons, if traveling at the precise speed, could initiate another set of fission reactions, each of which would then release, release uh, two more neutrons. And that process could continue. <clears throat> And that's exactly what they're trying to do inside of a nuclear reactor. So every single time, two more neutrons are released. And so this is what we get. We get a chain reaction. So our first neutron comes in. It produces two neutrons as a byproduct. If each of those neutrons hits each of their own uranium-235 nuclei, each of those will also release two neutrons. <clears throat> now, if each one of these produces two neutrons, and each of those neutrons bombard another uranium-235 nucleus, well, you're gonna get another set of reactions. So, I mean, this process will continue and continue. So these are just the first three stages. But what you can clearly see is that there's gonna be exponential growth. Starting with one, that splits into two, which becomes four and then eight. This is exponential growth. So unfortunately, again, the animation seems a bit frozen here. Now, there's two types of chain reactions. There's a controlled chain reaction, and then there's an uncontrolled chain reaction. The controlled chain reaction is desirable inside of the nuclear reactor. You don't want a runaway effect. So if things keep multiplying and the reaction just gets bigger and bigger and faster and faster, at some point you want this to slow down. So there are barriers and well, devices in place to slow down the reaction so it doesn't get out of hand. All of this we're going to study in great detail in grade 12 physics. Now, if you desire an uncontrolled fission reaction, that is the ingredient and that is the main step behind how uh, a nuclear bomb works. It's a runaway fission effect. All right, so now, so now let's talk about nuclear fusion. Fusion is when you combine two small nuclei into a larger nucleus. So for example, if you take deuterium, right, so this was an isotope of hydrogen, and tritium, an even heavier isotope of hydrogen, and you merge them, you get the helium-4 nucleus plus a neutron. Okay, so this sometimes happens in the core of stars. So remember, because they're all isotopes of hydrogen on the left, there should only be one proton, and the rest of the mass number is made up from neutrons. Now, in order to fuse, and this is why fusion is very hard, because they have to come together, they have to overcome the repulsive Coulomb force. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about it like this. Hydrogen-2 and hydrogen-3, or deuterium and tritium as they're also known, well, what are the charges? They're plus one and plus one. Remember, the neutrons have no charge. So what you're effectively trying to do is force these two particles that have the same charge together until they somehow react and merge. But you gotta remember that they are repelling at the same time. So if you have two really strong magnets and you bring the north pole of one close to the north pole of the other, they're gonna repel. And unless they're very weak magnets, you're not gonna be able to force those two sides of the magnet to touch. Now, that's what's happening here. So you need a really strong force in order to allow uh, the repulsive electric force or the repulsive Coulomb force to be overcome. Now, Stars do this all the time, and they do it quite naturally. How do stars overcome this force? Well, let me just show you something. Remember that if an object has mass, it will automatically exert a gravitational attraction on another object. So when you have a star, so inside of the star, you might have these particles. So obviously this is not to scale, but you might have, so here's your proton and neutron and your tritium proton and neutrons. Okay, so these are in the core of the star. Now there are other parts of the star as well. There's other outer layers to the star. But the idea is these stars are extremely massive. Now, when we're on the earth, so when, when you're on the surface of the earth, where do you feel attracted? Well, you feel attracted towards the center of the earth. But 
for someone who's standing on the other side of the world, you have to remember that from our perspective, they're upside down. And from their perspective, we're upside down. But the reason they're standing the way they are is because they're also attracted towards the center of the earth, because this is where the largest collection and symmetry of mass is. So right here in the middle. Now, it doesn't matter where you're standing, you'll always be doing so such that the force of gravity goes towards the center. So the idea is even the earth, it wants to collapse in on itself, but it doesn't because, well, it's made up of solid matter, right? So there's other forces in motion here. The star is an extremely massive object. Okay, so this is uh, several factors more massive than the Earth, even compared to a massive planet like Jupiter. And so its gravitational force is always pulling in. And so what that does is it creates an enormous pressure inside the core of the star. And if you have this gravitational attraction and the star is attempting to collapse in on itself, what happens? These particles get forced together in an area of very high temperature and very high pressure. And that is how the repulsive Coulomb force is overcome. Now, we have attempted to make fusion reactors on Earth, and there are some that exist, although they're not very efficient. And the reason for that is because the amount of energy that goes into merging these uh, lighter nuclei together using fusion, it's consuming more energy than it's actually producing. And so these nuclear fusion reactors at the moment use very precise and very strong magnetic fields in order to overcome that Coulomb force. But that's what's using a lot of energy, producing these really strong magnetic fields. And you can see even here in this diagram, you've got all sorts of magnets. You've got solenoid magnets, you've got toroidal magnets, poloidal magnets, which you don't need to worry about what those are. Just know that it's a lot of energy expense. So nuclear fusion is still experimental, but ideally we will get to that stage one day. And so back to the binding energy curve. So now we're going to interpret and learn something new about this curve. So earlier we saw that because iron is at the top of the curve, it has the highest binding energy per nucleon, hence it is the most stable element. Now, nuclear fusion will occur with elements on the left side of iron because everything in nature is always attempting to reach equilibrium. It attempts to reach a more stable state. So elements on the left side of iron, they want to become more stable, and so they want to move to the right. They move towards iron. So nuclear fusion will occur because in order to do that, they have to get heavier. Now on the left, so if you have uranium or tin or any of the other elements that are not listed here, they need to undergo nuclear fission. So in order to become stable, in order to have a higher uh, binding energy, in order to move higher on the curve, they have to move left. In other words, they have to lose mass. And so therefore, these ones will naturally undergo fission and the ones on the left will naturally undergo fusion. Now on the left, if these particles undergo fusion, they will release energy. When the particles on the right undergo fission, they release energy. But if you try to go in the opposite order, so for example, if you try to fuse something on the right, or fission something on the left, you will need to put energy in yourself. Now, how do stars do this process so effortlessly? Well, first of all, because of the reason I just showed you on the piece of paper, that enormous pressure that builds up inside the core of a star. But, well, let's see how the star is even formed. How does this nuclear reaction even start in the core of a star? Well, the beginning stages of a star is just a cloud of gas. Sometimes this is called the interstellar medium. Now, eventually, because of gravitational attraction, even if this is dust and gas, it's still particles that have mass. And so they're going to be attracted to each other. And now this part is what scientists don't know yet, why this disk will eventually start rotating. But the mass will collect, and it collects in the highest density in the center. Eventually, things flatten around, and it becomes a disk that keeps rotating. Now, as it gets bigger and bigger, it's able to collect more and more mass, kind of like a runaway effect. So we call that the protostar, kind of like a baby star. Now, it'll keep collecting mass until the point where that protostar is massive enough that fusion can begin. So think of it like this. If there's enough mass and there's enough gravitational contraction and compression such that the core of the star can finally reach a temperature and pressure high enough 
for this repulsive Coulomb force to be overcome. All of these gases, this is mainly hydrogen gas. Most stars, they start off with just hydrogen gas and they will fuse hydrogen through a series of reactions to produce helium and potentially heavier elements. Now, eventually you do reach equilibrium between radiation and gravity. We'll talk more about that on the next slide. So that's the phase that our sun is in right now. So we talked about the inward gravitational pressure. So the star is constantly trying to collapse in on itself. It wants to collapse. Now, what's holding it out? What's providing some outward push? Well, when you have nuclear fusion taking place in the core of the star, every time, let's say, two hydrogen nuclei fuse and become helium, there is a huge amount of energy that's released as a result. And so that, out, that energy that is released gets rushed outward. And so we call this radiation pressure. Now, when that radiation pressure counteracts and exactly balances the inward contraction due to gravity, we say that radiation pressure and gravitational attraction have reached equilibrium. In fact, that equilibrium is given a special name. It's called hydrostatic equilibrium. Don't worry about that name, but if you want to feel fancy and use it, please go ahead. Hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, this is interesting to note. The more that the hydrogen undergoes fusion, so assuming the entire star starts as hydrogen gas, so once all the hydrogen fuses into helium, you have to remember, based on what we actually calculated ourselves, when the two hydrogen merge with the two neutrons and become the helium-4 nucleus, there's a mass defect. And we said that that extra mass is in the form of energy. So yes, while that extra energy is what's keeping the star balanced against gravity, meanwhile, the mass of the star is going down. And so that if the mass of the star goes down, that means the gravitational attraction of the star is also going down. And so that inward contraction, that inward desire to collapse in on itself slightly decreases. And so if you still have this outward pressure due to radiation, and it's not exactly being balanced by the inward tendency to collapse in on itself, well, that star is going to have a net force outward, right? It won't be balanced anymore. So let me just show you this on a piece of paper before I well, show you the animation. So initially you have the star, you've got the inward desire to collapse due to gravity, and you have the outward push of radiation pressure, and they are balanced in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. And like I said, as you keep burning hydrogen gas into helium, the mass is getting less and less because the mass is getting used up and emitted in the form of energy, which is providing this outward radiation pressure. So eventually the mass of the star goes down. If the mass of the star goes down, then the gravitational attraction or the gravitational uh, collapse also decreases. And so we have less gravitational attraction, and I'm representing this by shorter arrows, but we have the same amount of outward radiation pressure. And so it's like a tug of war. It's a net force. Originally, the forces were balanced in every direction, but now all of a sudden there's more outward force than inward, right? So if there's more outward than inward, then the star is actually going to get a little bigger until a new equilibrium is reached. So let's go back to our slides. So that's what happens. The star gets bigger until the new equilibrium is reached. And this keeps going. So every time the star fuses new elements in its core, so if the star is massive enough to fuse helium in its core and produce even heavier elements, then eventually it's going to grow as well. And it's interesting. It seems counterintuitive, but it's actually growing because it's losing mass. Now, each star is a little different. Right? You've probably heard of black holes. A black hole is the end result when a very massive star, the most massive stars, finish their life cycle and finish burning whatever fuel existed in their core. Our sun is never going to become a black hole. It's not even going to become the next most interesting thing, which is a neutron star. Our sun is going to, in about four and a half billion years, going to fizzle out and become a white dwarf. Now let's talk about what that is. Well, 
when the fuel inside the core runs out. So once our star is done fusing hydrogen to helium, if it doesn't produce any other element past helium, well, that means the nuclear fusion inside the core is going to stop. So there will be no more outward radiation pressure. And so that means the only force is going to be the inward contraction due to gravity. And so this star is then going to start shrinking. It's going to start shrinking and getting smaller and smaller until particles start getting too close together, too close for comfort, let's say. Now, with stars like our sun, because they're not that big to begin with, the collapse due to gravity won't be as significant as it would be in more massive stars. And so when these particles get close together, you could say it like this. They become uncomfortable enough to push out on each other. So if you get all these charges that are very close coming together very quickly, there's going to be a sudden outward push. And essentially that sudden outward push just blows off the outer layers of the star, revealing the finished core that's inside. And that finished core is called a white dwarf. Now the white dwarf no longer has nuclear fusion occurring in its core. It no longer produces new energy. But whatever energy it does have, it just keeps shining. And so it's just going to be the small core of a star glowing until all of its energy finally runs out and cools down to zero. Now, this is going to be the fate of our sun. If this star is a bit more massive, and by a bit, I mean maybe twice or three times as massive as our sun or into the category that would become a white dwarf, this massive sun, which will eventually start collapsing due to the lack of radiation pressure moving outward, it will collapse to the point where all of the particles inside will fuse to become neutrons. So in addition to having the neutrons, the protons and the electrons will also fuse and become neutrons until pretty much what you have is an object just made out of neutrons. And so we call that a neutron star. Now, the neutron star is also going to release some sudden outward pressure. And that outward pressure is going to be much more violent than that from the white dwarf. And this is why this one is going to be called a supernova. Right? Now, yes, this is called the iron catastrophe because now this entire thing is made up of uh, neutrons. But the idea is that suddenly this star will simply blow out. The question then becomes, where do the elements above iron come from? It seems like only iron can be produced in the core of a star. So if we think about it, if we start off with hydrogen and then hydrogen atoms eventually fuse into helium and helium atoms then merge with other atoms to become even more massive, eventually they will have to stop. If you have a really massive star, like the one that can produce a neutron star at the end of its life, it can have and produce up to iron in its core. So essentially what you have in is an onion slice. You have an onion with different shells of different elements. And I'll include a picture of that for you to look at. But iron is the most massive element you can create in the core of a star because after iron, it doesn't make sense for there to be fusion because after iron, fusion requires energy. It doesn't produce energy. And so then the question is, where do elements after iron come from? And we do have elements after iron. We have aluminum, for example. You probably have aluminum foil in your kitchen right now. That is not man-made aluminum. That is extracted from natural sources. So the idea is, once you have the neutron star and the outer layers of the star blow away very violently, that is a supernova. And because the particles are moving away from the star at such high speeds, a lot of them will fuse together and become newer, heavier elements, heavier than iron. Finally, there is the black hole. If your star is so massive, so between 12 and 18 solar masses, so 12 to 18 times the mass of our sun, when it starts collapsing after the nuclear fuel has run out, it will just keep collapsing in on itself. It will never get to a point where there's going to be a sudden outward pressure as in the case of the white dwarf and neutron star to suddenly push out on its outer layers. There's so much gravitational collapse, it cannot be stopped. It's a runaway effect. So the matter keeps collapsing in on itself over and over and over again until space is warped itself and you get a black hole. Now, black holes are very mysterious objects in our universe. 
There is a lot not known about black holes, although it has recently been shown that they do in fact exist. And the very fact that light cannot escape from a black hole, that's why it appears black. It's the absence of light. So if light can't escape it, and light travels at 300 million meters per second, it is the fastest known speed in the universe, then for sure if you get sucked into a black hole, there's no escaping it. This last slide is simply showing the evolution sequence of various stars. So if you have a protostar, so all of these start off as protostars, but notice that the bigger the initial star or amount of gas is, the different the kind of star that is created. So our protostar, I mean, it's not that big to start with, it became the sun. So our star is about a yellow, yellow orange color. Eventually, when all the hydrogen fuses into helium, it's going to expand like we saw in the earlier slide. It's gonna become what's called a red giant. Once the helium has been exhausted, it is going to blow off all its outer layers. And so it's going to, you know, it's gonna look quite pretty like this. And what's left behind is the white dwarf. There's the white dwarf right in the middle. And that's the remnant core of the star, okay? Now, once the outer layers are fully blown off, that's all you're gonna have left. Now, that amount of gas surrounding the white dwarf, we call that a planetary nebula. Unfortunately, it's named a little bit inconveniently. Planets are not formed around this. Usually new stars are going to be formed here. Now, that's for our sun, right? So if you have uh, protostars that have more gas collected at the beginning, they might turn into blue stars. Now, if you're familiar with temperature, you might think that red is actually hotter than blue, but in fact, we just don't deal with high enough temperatures to see that blue is in fact a higher temperature than red. If you've ever looked at a candle, the candle flame that is at the wick, the hottest part of the candle is blue, whereas the rest of the candle flame is yellow. Okay, so blue is much, much hotter than yellow or red. And so that's why we've got these big blue stars. Now, these guys are going to be able to fuse elements much heavier than just hydrogen and helium. Okay, so they're going to be able to fuse up to and maybe, well, up to iron, that's for sure. Um, and some of them will die in what's called a supernova. And you can see there's two types of supernovas. There's type 1A and type 2. So we don't need to go into what those are. But uh, either they will end up as a black hole or they will end up as another type of nebula with a neutron star inside the middle. So overall, um, I mean, this is just here. This diagram is more here for you to, to help you understand the life cycle of the star, but under no need are you uh, required to memorize this page. So that is the end of lesson 7.2, Nuclear Reactions.